Okay, so chapter 24, part two, moving on to magnesium. So functions of magnesium is make part of the minerals that make up bone, as well as being a in fairly decent concentrations in the intracellular fluid, so inside the cells. Um, there, it's usually complexed with ATP molecules. It's also a cofactor for different enzymes, transporters, and nucleic acids. So maintaining your levels of magnesium in the body is partially through intestinal absorption, so absorbing magnesium from the food you eat, which is regulated by vitamin D. And then losing magnesium is usually through feces and urine. So imbalances of magnesium, so too little magnesium is hypomagnesium. Magnesia, so a plasma deficiency of magnesium, usually due to loss rather than not taking in enough magnesium in the body. So losing of those fluids through vomiting and diarrhea, um, your kidneys not working properly to keep magnesium in the body, as well as your intestines not absorbing the magnesium that you uh, ingested. Effects of this condition are hyperirritability of the nervous and muscular system, so them not function, uh, triggering action potentials like they should. Um, so it ends up with tremors in your muscles, spasms, tetanus, so that's your continued contraction, so not relaxing after a contraction, um, as well as hypertension, so high blood pressure, tachycardia, that's your mismatch of your heart rhythm as well as a heart arrhythmia. Opposite case of hypermagnesium, so too much magnesium, um, very rare unless your kidneys are malfunctioning. So in those cases end up being lethargic, being very weak, we weak reflexes since opposite effect than your hypomagnesium. So your nervous and muscular system are less um, hyper irritable, so less likely also to respond. Um, respiratory depression as well as hypotension, so opposite from here, as well as a flastic diastolic cardiac arrest. So moving on to your phosphates, so your phosphates are in higher concentrations on the inside of the cell, so in your intracellular fluid. Um, due to the hydrolysis of ATP, so when that ATP molecule is broken down, that phosphate is uh, removed off the ATP molecule, and therefore it's uh, able to just be inside the cell until that phosphate group is maybe added to either another ADP molecule, turning ADP back into ATP, or it's a part of a another other of another phosphate compound. So in the body, your sources of inorganic phosphates, um, so you have your just free phosphates, you also have monohydrogen phosphate as well as dihydrogen phosphate. So your phosphate makes up part of your nucleic acid as well as your phospholipids, so the phospho part of that. Um, your ATP energy molecule, your DTP hardly used energy molecule, your CAMP molecule, so your cyclic AMP, so monophosphate signaling molecule, as well as being a part of creatine phosphate. So your phosphates can usually activate many um, pathways by phosphorylating or adding a phosphate group to a particular enzyme or substrate and therefore uh, causing it to undergo a conformational change, which allows that uh, enzyme or substrate to be activated. Um, it also can work to help stabilize the pH of different body fluids. So by binding um, two positively charged ions, helping to maintain the pH in the body. So keeping your balance of your phosphates in the body, um, usually it's lost by glomerular filtration. So as you filter the blood, then it goes into your tubules. If your plasma concentration drops, then those renal tubules reabsorb all of your filtered phosphate. So what would have normally gotten lost is brought back into or reabsorbed 
in the body through that proximal convoluted tube. So one hormone that helps to regulate your phosphate levels is the parathyroid hormone, which causes an increase in the excretion of phosphate, so more phosphate loss through urine, so in those tubules. Um, it also increases the concentration of free calcium in the extracellular fluid. Um, by lowering your extracellular fluid concentration of phosphate also minimizes calcium phosphate from possibly forming so keeping calcium in this uh, sorry keeping calcium either sequestered inside the cell in the smoothie are or pumping it out into the extracellular fluid keeps that separated your phosphate usually stays inside the cell so keeping phosphate from being on the extracellular side where calcium has been pumped out keeps the calcium phosphate from forming for your phosphate, your uh, imbalances aren't as critical because your body can tolerate different variations in your phosphate levels. So it's not like your other um, ions that we talked about earlier where it the imbalances can cause serious conditions, problems. Okay, moving on to acid-base balance, so maintaining the pH in the body. It's one of the more important aspects of homeostasis, uh, sorry, homeostasis because of your pH level can determine your shape of different proteins. So enzymes, which being a, are a protein, if the pH is off, then the shape of that protein no longer is um, the way, way it should be. And therefore, for example, with a lot of enzymes, if you have that lock and key type of mechanism with an enzyme, if it's not in the right shape, then that lock and key type of mechanism will not work. Um, so deviation from a normal pH can shut down a pathway due to your enzymes or substrates not being in the correct shape due to your changes in pH. Um, it also can alter the structure of different macromolecules. So the pH of a solution is determined by how many hydrogen ions are in the solution. So any solution that easily releases um, acids, I'm sorry, not acids, easily releases hydrogen into a solution is an acid. If it's a strong acid, it usually gives up most of its um, hydrogen ions and therefore decreases the pH of a solution, making it very acidic. A weak acid, such as carbonic acid, so the acid formed from the, um, from carbon dioxide being hydrolyzed, um, only ionizes slightly, so it won't, not all of your carbonic acid dissociates into your hydrogen ion and then your bicarbonate ion. This type of acid, which is weak, usually keeps most of the hydrogen ions bound, and so it doesn't affect your pH much. So when you guys did the acid base experiment in lab where you had the phenol red in the Erlenmeyer, Erlenmeyer flask and then you added a little bit of sodium hydroxide which is a strong base to the solution causing the solution to turn a little bit more of a dark red then when you blew into that solution the carbon dioxide that you were blowing into the solution formed carbonic acid and so there's some hydrogen that was released to increase the pH and therefore in change the color of that solution back towards red. But whoever was blowing, if you remember, it took a long time because carbonic acid is such a weak acid. So the opposite type of solution is a base. So it's any chemical that accepts hydrogen ions or um, has your, oh, sorry, accepts hydrogen ions. So your strong bases that particularly have a hydroxide ions will easily bind to a hydrogen ion and therefore forming water. Um, this will typically um, raise your pH, so getting rid of those hydrogens that would normally lower pH. Weak ba bases, such as bicarbonate, so the ion that dissociates from carbonic acid um, binds less of your um, hydrogen ions in a solution and therefore having less of an effect. So it just depends on 
how well that base is able to bind to hydrogen ions to um, get rid of them out of that solution and therefore increasing the pH and making that solution more basic. So the normal pH of blood is 7.35 to 7.45, so slightly basic, so a little bit above neutral. But with all of your metabolic reactions in the body, they form a lot of different acids that counter that pH. So in order to maintain the pH, there are a lot of buffers that um, can be added to help resist changes in pH. So it either converts a strong acid or a base to a weak one. So that now that weak one can have a low possibility of affecting the pH in the blood. So typically, in, so in your body, the buffers are called physiological buffer. Um, there's different systems to control the output of your acid bases as well as your carbon dioxide. There's two buffer systems. There's one from your urinary system and then one from the respiratory system. So when we do the acid base worksheet, we'll actually look at how changes in pH and different levels and for example carbon dioxide um, can be looked at to see whether or not the problem is with your urinary system or like your kidneys or with your respiratory system and which one can fix it. So for example if there's a problem with the urinary system and your um, levels are off then your respiratory system which is functioning can then therefore take up the slack and then vice versa. So if Let's say for some reason you um, are having breathing issues and so you're not breathing off that carbon dioxide like you should, so your carbon dioxide levels are high, your urinary system can um, take over and therefore help to adjust your pH. So another type of buffer is a chemical buffer, um, just binds to those hydrogen ions from a solution or release it depending on uh, the need to maintain a particular pH in a solution. So it happens very quickly unlike your physiological buffers which take a little bit longer. Um, it's a mixture of different weak acids and weak bases. So those weak acids and bases help to make slight adjustments in the levels of hydrogen ions and therefore maintaining the levels of the pH of a solution. So there's three major chemical buffers in the body. You have bicarbonate, so again from your um, carbonic acid reaction. You also have phosphate, so that's free flowing inside your cells. And then different protein systems can also work as a chemical buffer for the body. So going back to our physiological buffers. So the first buffer system is the bicarbonate buffer system. So based on the levels of carbonic acid as well as the bicarbonate ions. So still using the carbonic acid reaction, but depending on the need to maintain a particular pH, it can either go in the, go in the right direction that releases hydrogen and therefore lowers the pH, so makes it more acidic or goes in the left or reverse direction, therefore binding up this hydrogen and um, keeping it from causing the pH of a solution to be low and therefore raising the pH. So the bicarbonate buffer system coordinates with both your lungs and kidneys to control the pH as well as your CO2 levels. So in order to lower the pH, so therefore make something more acidic, the kidneys will excrete bicarbonate, so that gets lost as urine and therefore leaving those hydrogen ions to be in your body systems and therefore keeping your, uh, the acidity of that solution up. In order to raise the pH, so make something more basic, the kidneys will excrete the hydrogen ion, so the opposite case of here, as well as the lungs excreting carbon dioxide. So going back to this slide here, so by excreting hydrogen, so getting rid of this, so therefore less 
Um, hydrogen ions adding to the acidity of a solution. Also taking this reaction, reversing it, getting rid of the CO2. So therefore you don't have the first part of this reaction going towards the right and end up making more hydrogen ions. So basically getting rid of part of the problem before you have um, those hydrogen ions made. The other buffer system is the phosphate buffer system, and this is one where it is a mixture of your different weak acid and weak bases. So it's a solution of monohydrogen phosphate as well as dihydrogen phosphate. So it's a reversible reaction where your monohydrogen, dihydrogen phosphate gets converted to monohydrogen phosphate a hydrogen ion as well as a phosphate ion. Um, so like in your bicarbonate uh, buffer system proceeds to the right, so going through this um, reaction, liberating your hydrogen ions, therefore decreasing the pH, going to the left, so going backwards, binding up those hydrogen ions and therefore they're not able to be in solution and therefore decrease the pH. So getting rid of them allows the pH of that system to be increased. It's important for buffering in your intracellular fluid as well as in your renal tubules. So inside those, uh, the nephrons and your kidneys. So there you have more phosphates are concentrated and the optimal pH is slightly acidic. So, uh, helping to use those phosphates that are already there to help balance and buffer the pH in those systems. So the last physiological buffer system is using uh, proteins. Um, they're more concentrated than bicarbonate and your phosphate ions. Um, they actually make about three quarters of the chemical buffering in your body. So depending on the side groups on their amino acids allows them to either release hydrogen, so our carboxyl group on the end of amino acid, release hydrogen when your pH uh, begins to rise or become too basic, and so releasing the hydrogen makes it more acidic. Or on the amino side group, binding to hydrogen when the pH gets too low and therefore getting rid of that hydrogen that adds to the acidity of a solution making the solution more basic. So the bicarbonate buffer system um, is part of how your respiratory system is able to buffer the pH in the body. So by decreasing your um, respiratory rate, so less breathing in and out, helps to add, add or increase the levels of carbon dioxide in the body fluid since you're not getting rid of that carbon dioxide from breathing it out. So going through that carbonyl, carbon, carbonic acid reaction, therefore raising your um, hydrogen levels and therefore lowering the pH, making it more acidic. Opposite case, so increase your breathing, Therefore, getting rid of that carbon dioxide out the body, so removing the carbon dioxide, so instead of that reaction going towards the right, we're now going towards the left, so there's less hydrogen from that reaction, therefore lowering that level, and therefore increasing the pH, so making the body fluid more basic. So this actually can neutralize way more acid than your chemical buffers can because you're removing the one of the initial problems in the first place. So problem with carbon dioxide, it's constantly produced by cells that are um, metabolically active. Uh, normally it's eliminated by the lungs just as, as fast as it's created by the body. So by adjusting the pulmonary ventilation, so how much of, are you breathing, so just described that earlier, determines how much of these carbon dioxide you can get rid of or keep and therefore 
adjusting how you're going to uh, adjust the pH in the body by getting rid of or keeping your carbon dioxide. So moving on to the urinary system with your renal control of pH. Um, so your kidneys can actually neutralize uh, more acid or base than either the right respiratory system or your chemical buffers since it just gets rid of either your hydrogen ions or your bicarbonate ions. So in this first case, your renal tubules secrete hydrogen ions into the tubular fluid. So getting rid of that hydrogen ions from the body. So therefore increasing the pH, making it more basic. Um, that free hydrogen that were secreted in the tubular fluids then just excreted out as part of your urine waste. So they're actually getting rid of those excess hydrogen ions. Okay, um, so this only works to a particular pH, so as the hydrogen ions are um, secreted into the tubular fluid, those hydrogen ions are going to lower the pH of the um, tubular fluid, and so eventually, by the time you get to a pH of 4.5, which is fairly acidic, then the secretion of it stops. So you don't want to have like too acidic urine because you might not start damaging your tissues. Um, so this is prevented by buffers in the tubular fluid. So with your bicarbonate system, the bicarbonate ions will bind to your hydrogen ions and therefore neutralizing some of those um, uh, hydrogen ions. So when you do a urinalysis, you shouldn't see bicarbonate inside the urine because it should bind to the hydrogen. Um, other tubular buffers, so you have your phosphate system, so reacts with some of your hydrogen, replacing sodium in the buffer, so you go from sodium, hydrophosphate, and a free hydrogen ion to sodium dihydrogen phosphate and the free sodium ion. Um, ammonia, oh, sorry, ammonia. Ammonia can also neutralize by binding to a free hydrogen ion um, as well as a chloride ion and therefore forming ammonium chloride, which is a weak acid. But still, focus on getting those hydrogen ions. Okay, so a few more slides. Um, so disorders of acid-base balance. So when your pH of the body drops below 7.35, your body goes into acidosis, so it's slightly acidic. Um, so your hydrogen diffuses into the cell, moving potassium out. This is why your potassium is buffered by the proteins inside the cell. So you don't um, lose those potassiums out the cell. Um, if you don't buffer that hydrogen being in uh, diffusing into the cell, it can cause membrane hyperpolarization. So you're less likely to fire an action potential, making that cell harder to stimulate. So in your central nervous system particularly, can lead to um, confusion, disorientation, coma, and possibly death. So you're... Basically, your brain's not working right because you can't fire the action potentials like you should. The other disorder is alkalosis, so your body's too basic, so above a pH of 7.45. So opposite case, hydrogen goes out the cell, potassium diffuses in, making the membranes more depolarized, so they're um, more likely to fire an action potential, becoming more stimulated. Muscles go into spasm as well as tetany, so your fused um, muscle contractions as well as convulsions. And then respiratory paralysis because you're not able to have the breathing from the diaphragm getting that signal to um, correctly contract and relax that muscle. So there's two types of acid-base balance. You have a respiratory acid-base balance and, sorry, respiratory imbalance or a metabolic one. So respiratory imbalance, you have acidosis where there's carbon dioxide accumulating in the extracellular fluid and therefore lowering the pH because the carbon dioxide goes to that whole carbonic acid reaction releasing hydrogen. Um, respiratory alkalosis, so your 
body getting rid of the carbon dioxide, typically from hyperventilating. Um, so with your carbon dioxide being eliminated faster than it's produced, it reduces your carbonic acid level. So there's less of that hydrogen being in your extracellular fluid and therefore less of it, um, you know, adding to the acidity of your pH and therefore your body goes to a being more basic. So metabolic conditions, so metabolic acidosis, so increased production of your different organic acids through either just um, your metabol meh, metabolism, so um, as you exercise, building up the lactic acid, that's why you're sore afterward. Um, anaerobic fermentation, so not having enough oxygen, so having to switch, for, for more, which makes more lactic acid. Um, ketone bodies, which is seen in alcoholism as well as in um, some of your diets where you have low carb and high fat. So when you break up that fat, you end up releasing ketone bodies. So if it's too high, then you probably go to acidosis and then also diabetes. Um, acidic drugs can do so. So for example, it's like an aspirin and then loss of base due to loss of fluids from diarrhea or use of laxatives. The other case, your metabolic alkalosis. So now your pH is too high. So overuse of bicarbonate, such as your antiacids, as well as a IV drip that has bicarbonate in it. Uh, so all of these will bind up those free hydrogens and therefore increasing the pH and your um, pH becoming more basic, as well as loss of stomach acid. So loss of those hydrogen ions, therefore increasing the pH and making your body more um, acidic. So to correct these conditions, either the kidneys compensate for a pH balance from a respiratory origin or the respiratory system uh, compensates for a pH balance in the metabolic, with a metabolic origin. So basically they'll at least help each other out if one's not correctly functioning. Um, if it's not compensated or not uh, made adjustment for, then you need clinical intervention to make sure that your pH stays balanced. So with respiratory compensation, so your respiratory system making up for what your kidneys should be doing. Um, so by changing your breathing or your pulmonary ventilation to correct your pH by either getting rid of your CO2 or retaining your CO2. So for example, if there's too much CO2 or hypercapnia, stimulating more ventilation, so more breathing to get rid of that uh, carbon dioxide out of the body. Hypocapnia, so not enough CO2 in the body, so you are uh, in more of a basic situation, then reduce your ventilation, so reduce your breathing, allowing for your carbon dioxide to accumulate, so it can go through that carbonic acid reaction, therefore releasing the hydrogen and lowering the pH. Okay, last slide. Um, so, respiratory system has its job to compensate for renal compensa compensation is due to how much of the hydrogen is either secreted or um, retained from the renal tubules. It's a very slow process, but it's actually better at restoring a normal pH. So when your body is in acidosis, so it's too acidic, um, the hydrogen ions are excreted out as part of the tubular fluid, becoming part of your urine, which drops the urine pH due to all that excess hydrogen, um, and therefore your pH is able to be increased or elevated to reestablish that balance in the body. So getting rid of the hydrogen that's um, in excess helps to raise the pH. For alkalosis, um, so your pH is too high or 8.5 due to excess bicarbonate. So decreasing the rate of hydrogen secretion, so less hydrogen is lost, um, allows for that hydrogen to bind with the bicarbonate and therefore lowering the pH in the body. No, I should say, yeah. So lowering the pH in the body, um, therefore going from a higher basic pH, dropping it down to a more normal one. So because the kidneys are slow, um, it can't do it for short-term pH balances. So it's more for correcting an imbalance that lasts for a few days or longer. 
So that's the end of this chapter. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, either through, usually Blackboard, but uh, depending especially on the weekend, um, do it through email and that way it's a whole lot faster. All right, thanks, bye.